Okay, so chapter 16 is just another um, one of our uh, travel through zoology. Um, we're starting with the arthropods. Arthropods. Um, and uh, let's look at some general characteristics that all members of the arthropods have. And, uh, and then we'll start talking about uh, actually subphyla. Remember, we can take a phylum and divide them into smaller categories if necessary before we go from kingdom, phylum, class, all the way down to class. Okay? One thing that all arthropods have is they have an exoskeleton. What does that mean? What does an exoskeleton mean? It's an outside skeleton. Exo means outside, so they have a skeleton on the outside. No matter what animal you're talking about in this, they do have a skeleton on the outside. Okay, And their skeleton is made out of chitin. Remember we had that earlier when we were in a chapter, I think it was talking about fungi, where we had the topic of chitin. Uh, so it's made out of that kind of material. Uh, one thing, because they have an exoskeleton, they can't grow without molting. Okay? They can't grow without molting. Um, this picture over here uh, at the bottom, as I'm looking at that particular one, you recognize what this is at the top. You probably see it in this stage, not in the, what we call the pupa stage. Anybody recognize it? And what is it called? They make lots of noise in summer. Cicadas. Cicadas, okay. Uh, what was it? Uh, the retreat before last, when we went to that camp, uh, I forget what the name of the camp, Camp of the Good Shepherd, was that what it was called? Something like that. Uh, well, in the evening, uh, when you guys were playing around on the on the uh, the basketball court area, uh, on one of the trees there was a cicada emerging from its pupil stage. I have pictures on my phone uh, that uh, where it, it was slowly crawling out, and then the last picture I have where it's totally out. The, the its wings are. You know, all pretty wrinkly still. Uh, it doesn't have the kind of like the normal, what I'd call medium green color that a cicada typically has. Uh, it because they will usually when uh, when these animals molt, they usually are pretty light colored at first, and then they get darker with with time. Uh, but he's crawling out, and then these wings will become inflated so that they can fly. So molting is one thing they all have to be able to do to grow. So every time to get to the next size, they have to molt. Okay? They have jointed appendages. Okay? So they bend here, here, and here. Okay? We have jointed appendages too, but remember they have their skeleton on the outside. Okay? So... <coughs> They, uh, all arthropods have segmentation. Remember, that was one of the things on our chart in the last chapter is, you know, do they have segmentation or not? And these clearly do. They have a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. Those are the three main parts. Uh, the head and the thorax is called a cephalothorax. So this, this goes down too far. It should go only to here. So the uh, cephalo means head. And thorax is like chest, okay? And then they have an abdomen. So this is a, a, a spider. If it has a red hourglass on it, it's a what? Black widow. A black widow spider. Uh, so that just happens to be a, a drawing of that. But this part up here is the cephalothorax, and then it has an abdomen. So they all have three parts. Some insects will, or some of these arthropods will actually have three separate segments. Sometimes they merge two of them together. If they do, it'll be like the head and thorax will be, will be in one, like, for instance, like the spider has. 
they have an open circulatory system. So open circulatory system, which by the way, while I am thinking about it, some of you have come to ask questions about your assignment and um, it lists them, it wants you to put down what is the nine life processes for um, the arthropods. If you go back to the chapter 15, um, at, it has all nine of them listed there. there. A lot of them are the same ones that were on our chart, but my chart had more categories than just those nine. So if you look there, they're, they're the words that are in italics, you know, like uh, support, um, nutrition, uh, reproduction, things like that. that so you, how do they carry the carry out each of these processes? So they have an open circulatory system. Uh, their circulatory system has dorsal heart. Dorsal means what again? What's dorsal mean? Yeah, the opposite word is ventral, so what would that be? You can get. Like the back of this animal, or the top side, if you want to think about that. So for an animal that's in this position, that would be its back or top side. So dorsal. So they have a, um, a heart that's uh, on the top side of their body. Uh, now, as far as their nervous system, they all have a nervous system. And they... Um, Often will have antennae of different sizes. Uh, they the antennae can be just long or just short and and skinny. They can be long, uh, like for instance on a uh, uh, crayfish. They can have really long ones. They're like whips almost. Uh, then some they can have different shapes. They're just necessarily long and skinny. If you've ever looked at some moths. They have their, it comes out like this and it has branches off to the side. So they're, they're pretty large, you know, they can sense a larger amount of energy. Okay, so they have antennae, they have eyes, uh, like in this one down here, uh, they, it has two kinds of eyes. This one has many lenses and these lenses each make their own image. Uh, and there can be hundreds of these lenses. So they have hundreds of images. Sometimes you would, you, they call it a mosaic. I mean, it doesn't quite fit the way I typically think of a mosaic, is that each part is part of the whole of one big picture. These lenses that make up the compound eye, each one is a whole picture. So they have many pictures, but they're so I don't know how the brain processes that many different pictures, but what they are, are basically sensing, is there a difference between the images? Or, you know, like if you try to catch a fly, for instance, how does it know that you are, you, by sensing what's changing in some of those images? Uh, not necessarily what, or is there a change, you know, in those images, okay? Like this particular one has a compound eye, but then it has simple eyes. Uh, spiders also have some simple eyes. They're just like a single lenses. So this, they just get one picture. Uh, the antennae, uh, you know, stick out the head region. And what do they use these antennae for? Well, this is how, if you've ever watched some of them, they actually touch their antennae on different things and they are either tasting it or smelling it or touching it. You know, that's how they sense their, their environment is with their antennae. Now, they also, as it says here, it's almost all of them have some kind of eye. Could be a simple eye all the way to compound eye or maybe even both, both kinds, simple and compound. Uh, and as I said, the compound eyes, and it says the insect or insecta, that would be a class that we're going to talk about, <coughs> and the crustaceans, usually live in water, 
uh, don't have, not all of them live in water, but often live in water. They have thousands of these individual lenses that make up this compound eye. Now you can't see each individual one unless you probably use like a dissecting microscope or a good magnifying lens. Uh, and, and because they're, this surface is kind of curved, each one's kind of pointing in slightly different directions. So parts of each image are going to be similar or overlapping uh, with other images. The simple eye, like those that the spider has, contain, like it says, only one lens, and it's a very limited view. But you can only see a small portion up there. Now, we're going to talk about, take the phylum, and we're going to divide it into subphyla. Remember, we can divide them to subphyla before we go down onto class. And uh, lobsters, crayfish, uh, like a crayfish, this is the one that we're going to dissect, is the crayfish. It's just like a um, small cousin of the lobster. Uh, has essentially all the same parts. It's just that it's a small version of the other one. Uh, and you can have different kind of crayfish as far as coloring is concerned. Then we have crabs over here. You know, the snow crab and all the other crabs that you can think of. Uh, the only one that doesn't fit into this one is the horseshoe crab. It belongs in a different one. And this one is the what? What do you call these? You maybe haven't seen it quite that big. But we have lots of those in our area. They're called what? What do we call them? They will often take their body parts and do that. Those are roly polies, is what we call them, you know? Probably different parts of the world, they call them different things, but we call them roly polies uh, or pill bugs. They have a hard shell on the outside with lots of little legs on, underneath there. Um, they're, they're, they feed on dead, decaying and plant and animal matter. So that wherever that's at, they like that. Uh, and then these are barnacles that um, typically grow in a marine air, area. You know, they'll grow on the sides of the pilings for a dock or on the sides of a boat. And when they, uh, I mean, I've even seen those on, uh, like humpback whales will have barnacles growing on them. Uh, what they do is they do um, slow up the boat as it's moving through the water. So have you heard that st statement, you know, like it's about time to knock off some of the barnacles? You know, those are like parasitic things that grow on the side of something else that's kind of slow you up. That's what the, what the, phrase is trying to, to communicate, you know, sometimes you got to knock off the things that are slowing you up. Uh, but they do uh, grow on the side of, you know, anything that stays stationary long enough, they'll grow on it. So let's look at one of those examples in that uh, subphylum called Crustacea. And we're going to look at the crayfish. This is the one that we're going to dissect and we're going to learn a little bit more about it. Uh, as far as their movement, the, they have these walking legs here. Uh, this one is also called a, a, one, its first leg, but it doesn't usually use the, that big pincer one, the kilopeds, for walking. It's more for defense or for catching its prey or something like that, okay? And um, they also have, I mean, these walking legs is primarily the ones that support them as they move around. Now, some of these legs have little hooks on the end, or most of them have little hooks on the end. Of them. Some of them have two hooks on the end, almost like fingers for pinching. And they will then, they're, they're constantly kind of feeling around in the sand and gravel, and when they find a food particle, I don't know how it senses it's a food particle, then it will put it up to its mouth to eat it. Okay, so these are 
are used for catching their prey or holding it while they want to eat it. Um, the school that I taught in Kansas City, we uh, when I taught biology then, uh, we had an aquarium that was probably about this long, about this high, and about this wide. And you know, most aquariums, a lot of people like uh, like to have. Uh, well, the, the typical things that you have tropical fish inside it. I wanted to have an aquarium that you just don't ordinarily see. So we made it a freshwater one. I wanted it to be like what you would find in the creeks and streams and, and rivers that were around Kansas City. It would, would have worked for here too. And uh, in there we had some crayfish. And then I also had um, purchased some minnows, typically for fishing purposes, but uh, they were chub minnows, they were a little fat, the little fatter kind of minnows, and put those inside of there. I had two uh, crayfish, and um, they would sometimes, you know, stick their kilopeds out like this when the other one would come by, you know, like they're in a defensive mode, you know, just stay away. Uh, but they would sometimes sit for long periods of time just like that, waiting for one of those minnows Fly, to swim close enough that they could catch it. And I remember watching one time, and it did catch one of those minnows that ventured a little bit too close. And, and then it, it used that kilopad to bring the minnow to, now this is looking at the underside of the, of the crayfish. I forgot to tell you that. This is the underside. And right in here are, is where its mouth is located, and it has Mandibles, like we have an upper mandible and a lower mandible, that's our jaw. They have, their mandibles go sideways. You know, we chew this way, they chew this way. Okay, and so when you're dissecting the, the crayfish, you'll be able to see where those mandibles are. Uh, and it's amazing how fast that crayfish was chewing up that minnow. Yeah, but the pieces would fall down and then these little legs with pincers on the end of it would find these little pieces and put it up in the mouth. So they, but where are the muscles located on an animal with an exoskeleton? They're not on the outside like ours, are they? So where are they? They have to be logically where? On the inside, okay? And because they're on the inside, to be able to grow, muscles bigger, they need to get a new skeleton. So they'll have to molt to become a bigger crayfish or lobster or whatever it is. They have to molt. And because the skeleton is on the outside and the muscles are on the inside, it kind of ultimately limits how big they can be. You know, they, don't, they can't grow as big as dinosaurs or anything like that. Just because the skeleton will become so heavy with not enough room for muscles to be able to move them around, okay? So they have legs, quite a few legs as you can see here. These are pairs of walking legs. They also have underneath their abdomen some uh, appendages that are, are a lot, they look a lot flimsier that they move like this, and they move, they, these tend to all move this way toward the front of that, and they can create water currents from the tail end toward the front end to obviously bring food, any particles of food up closer to the mouth, but also uh, to go bring water by their gills. They actually have gills. So they have the outer shell around their cephalothorax, and then in be underneath that is the gills, and then underneath that is the body, the, the regular part of the body. So in between that armor and the body is where the gills are located. And there's, this can sweep water by their gills. Um, now, the, the crayfish that we had in our aquarium, um, every once in a while would get out. And crayfish have this remarkable ability with this telson, that's these middle two parts, and the uropod, which is the outer two 
So it's like four things there, and they can whip it forward or underneath them really fast for protection, but it will also propel them backwards. So if they're being attacked, they can get out of danger very quickly just by whipping that thing underneath them and they go shooting backwards. Now, I'm not sure what caused the crayfish to get out of the aquarium, but that's probably, they didn't, couldn't, there was no way they could climb out. They'd have to actually propel themselves out of the aquarium. So I'd come to school in the morning and the crayfish would be missing. So we'd go looking to see where that was. Well, animals like that tend to always crawl in all the places, you know, that you never dust. And so when we would finally find the crayfish, they were usually covered with quite a bit of lint and spider webs and stuff like that. And, but they were still alive. Because the gills were between their body and the shell, they could hold enough water in there to get oxygen. Uh, I don't know how long they would be out of the aquarium. I had no idea when during the night they decided to propel themselves out. And we did this more than once. We would have to take them over to the faucet and rinse them off, get all the, the spider webs and lint off of them, and then we'd throw them back in the aquarium and they'd be just fine. So where it looks like it's more sprinkle time. When you put your head down, I know you're not trying to stay awake. Okay? Uh, so, that is, uh, is how they can move as well. So they have, it's not just their legs, these, the swimmerettes aren't enough to make them move, but that can propel them very rapidly backwards. Uh, so they, um, now, other life processes, nutrition. Okay, we've already talked a little bit about them, that they um, will either catch their own, like I said, catch their own food, like maybe minnows or something like that, small animals, or uh, they do pick up pieces of plant or animal material, you know, and feed themselves with that as well. So on the, uh, on the head end, this is the head end of the crayfish, they do have a mouth. In front of the mouth were those mandibles. And then they have some appendages on the outside that can help hold it. Uh, not, they don't grip it like the chelipeds can. They, they're kind of bent sort of like this, and they can kind of hold it like this in front of their mouth. This would be smaller pieces that they would use for that. Um, and then they feed this through the mouth, and then you, after the mouth comes the esophagus, and then into the stomach, okay? Into the stomach. Um, they do have a digestive gland here that secretes digestive juices to help it, uh, help in digestion. Um, so ingestion means taking it in through the mouth. Uh, digestion is gonna happen, start in the stomach, and then be completed by the time it gets to the end of the intestines. Um, so esophagus and stomach. Uh, one other thing is they have something that's called a gastric mill. It almost looks like teeth. And they are uh, they kind of meet, uh, if I remember right, there's three of them. And they move back and forth like that. They kind of are doing the same thing. If you remember when we looked at the earthworm uh, and we said it had a, a gizzard? Well, this is kind of like the, their version of a gizzard. It's used to grind up stuff into smaller pieces so it can be di uh, digested, okay? And they do have a regular digestive gland that uh, we will probably be able to find that when we dissect our crayfish, okay? And then the food after it's broken down will go through the intestines, and then what's not digested will go out through the anus, okay? So they have a complete digestive system. Okay, another life process uh, is circulation. And what kind of circulatory system do they have? Okay. Uh, 
they have an open circulatory system, which means what? What does it mean to be an open circulatory system? Because we've already talked about that in the, we had uh, several who said that the, uh, the clam had an open circulatory system uh, in the last uh, section that we were covering. It means that the blood only flows in vessels part of the time. Part of the time it just kind of seeps back through the body tissue to be uh, accumulated and uh, it will accumulate in this area around the heart that's called the pericardial sinus. The sinus is just an open area. Like we have nasal sinuses, but you have other sinuses in your body that, that collect materials of some time or allow certain things to pass through. So they have a pericardial sinus along with their dorsal heart. They actually do have a heart. Um, and then they also have a, a sinus at the bottom that after the blood is pumped out from the heart so it has to accumulate somewhere and it accumulates in this um, area down on the bottom called uh, the sternal sinus. Oh. Here is uh, what I was talking about. Here are the gills that are located uh, between the outer shell on the outside and the, the regular body part, I would call it like that. But the gills are in between there. They're kind of feather-like. Looks like They almost look like wet feathers is what they look like. Okay, excretion. So they have to get rid of uh, liquid body waste, and they have a structure up here called a green gland, and the green gland does for the crayfish what our kidneys do for us. But notice where it's located. It's located right above the mouth, okay? That's not where our kidneys empty out of our body, are they? We don't have it next to our mouth, but that's where God puts it. But if these swimmerettes are moving water this way, where will that excretion go? Away from the front, right? So it's going, to be, it's going to be moved away. Now, had it been emptied back here, where you would think it would be, these swimmerettes would move that right back by their mouth. You know, so it makes, when you start thinking about it, it makes sense where God put it so that it would go away from the crayfish without going by the gills, going by the mouth, and all that. You know, so it makes sense where God put it, but your first thought is, why? You, it empties its kidneys right next to its mouth? No, but the water's moving the other direction because of these swimmerettes. Now, as far as response, um, they have a ventral nervous system, okay? That means it runs on what part of the body? Ventral is which side? Uh, well, like the front if you're standing up, but the ears were laying down, so beyond the bottom, okay? Uh, they have a number of sensory organs. They have these antenna and antennules. They kind of as you study the crayfish, they'll cover what's the difference between them, what, you know, what does one do, what does the other one do. One senses vibrations, the other one senses things like smell and taste and things like that. Um, we said also that already that they have compound eyes. They don't have simple eyes though, they just have compound eyes and their eyes are on little stalks. Uh, they're, if you look at the crayfish from above, they, they have a pointy part that goes right at the top, and then it kind of is indented on either side, right underneath this pointy rostrum, they call it. And the eye is actually on a stalk, and they have the ability to tuck their little eyes in, especially if they're fighting. You don't want the your, en your opponent, your enemy, pinch your eyes off, you know, so they can tuck their eyes in, you know, below this so they can't grab a hold of it, uh, but they, they can see, 
So because they have eyes, but they're just compound eyes, no simple eyes. Um, they also have something called statocysts. Now, statocysts um, are to them kind of like you have in your inner ear the ability to tell if you are standing up or you're tipping over, if you're laying on your back or if you're upside down, you know, you have something that tells you which, which direction my body is facing uh, in our inner ear. Well, this does that for them. So if you take a crayfish and put him in the water upside down, he knows that he's upside down and he will work to get himself tipped over again. Reproduction, um, as far as asexual reproduction, the only part that fits into this is not actually reproduction, it's more like repair or replacement. If in the course of life, maybe they're being attacked by something or another crayfish and they lose one of their, let's say, walking legs, uh, it will uh, regenerate uh, the leg that it's lost. So if you, while we're dissecting your crayfish, if you find one that has a little stump like this over there, it's just in the process of growing back that leg. But it's not kind of like what we talked about in the pre previous chapter where, for instance, like a crayfish, I mean like a, uh, well let's see, like a starfish, for instance, could grow back an array or if it could grow back the rest of the, the starfish, it, this, it can't do that, okay? But uh, your, the crayfish do have separate sexes. So in other words, there will be male crayfish and female crayfish. Um, if you find one of, your, uh, of the crayfish that we dissect, you know, we'll just hand them out to each of you. If you find one that looks like it has lots of little berries underneath its abdomen, that are actually being held by the swimmerettes, that's a female, that's where, how they carry their eggs. They release eggs, but then they're kept in the swimmerettes. Um, they will also be other things that they will um, say that will indicate that this is a female if you don't see the, the eggs. Now, our eggs probably won't be this color. These kind of almost look like little tiny purple grapes, but. Ours will probably be more, I think, in the black range, if you see them at all. But females also have some of their um, appendages that look different than males, because they have it has a different purpose. Uh, now, when they molt, uh, you know, they crawl completely out of the shell that they originally have. It's, it's almost like their their shell is like your crawling out of a, um, like a onesie, you know, back when you are a little baby you had a onesie, they, they crawl, I mean, but the onesie also goes over their head, so they pull everything out, usually out through the back, right, where the thorax, uh, cephalothorax, or the thorax is, that's where they pull themselves all completely out of that, and uh, they're often very light colored at first, that's, first of all, they don't, their, their exoskeleton's not hardened yet, and it's not dark colored, so they're, they're defenseless on many levels. They're real easy to spot for their predators to, to find them. So you're not gonna find out them typically out in the open. They're gonna probably wanna do this in the dark or some place where they can hide until they're darker colored and their shell has hardened, so they can, it uh, protects them. But they, they have to molt to be able to grow. Okay, so let's look at another subphylum called the uh, <coughs> Chelicerata. I always have to see, if I don't start these words right, you, it doesn't turn out well, okay? Uh, they have claws. Um, now, these claws, um, and that's just what makes makes them that. Um, the underneath this category, you have a class called arachnida. Those are the spiders. You probably all heard the term. You know, arachnids is, are. I think they used to be even. A, they made a movie a long time ago called Arachnids. 
It's about spiders. Uh, that grew big, apparently. From I think if I I never watched the movie, but seeing little bits and pieces of it. Big spiders uh, fit into that. Uh, what kind of spider does is this one? Tarantula. Tarantula. Uh, in the southern part of the United States, you tarantulas. Where I lived in the northern part of Oklahoma, tarantulas were pretty common. Um, they like to, um, in fall, when it was, because remember, they're, they're cold-blooded animals, so they take in whatever the temperature of the environment, and they want, and they can function better if they're warmer. So in the evening when the temperature would drop down, they would like to congregate on any, like a rock or anything that stayed warm, and black asphalt highways was where they would like to crawl on top of it. Then as you drive along at night, you'd drive over these, and you could actually hear when you would drive over these, uh, they would make a popping sound. Uh, but now we'd take translas and we'd put them on our hand and they'd crawl along. I think they're one of the most pretty spiders there is. Most spiders, I don't particularly like the looks of them, but they're, they're so, they look like they have hairy bodies and they just crawl along so gently along. I never heard of anybody ever being bitten by a, by a tarantula, but I know they are poisonous, and especially the ones that are in uh, like Latin America, South America, they can be, but tarantulas typically aren't. Um, these are the ones you have to typically watch out for. They're called scorpions. Um, of the 12 years that we lived in Phoenix, and we did a lot of hiking up in the, in the mountains around there, and we should have seen scorpions and never saw one. The only scorpion I've ever seen in my life outside of a zoo was actually in Oklahoma. You're peering over the edge of a spillway uh, at a dam, you know, holding on the concrete, looking over there, and I lifted my arm up, and in this crack between the segments was a scorpion down in there, but he chose not to sting me, so at least I was fine, but he was, I mean, he's probably only about that big. The, uh, one of my teacher friends from Phoenix um, had trouble with scorpions in their yard. In fact, one day he was putting on his shoes in the morning and there was a scorpion in there and got stung on the bottom of his foot, so that was very painful. And so, but they had so much trouble with scorpions that they wanted to know how do you get rid of them. Well. Scorpions live is around where their favorite food source is, their prey, and those are crickets. They like crickets. Well, where do crickets live? Crickets live where you have decaying, decaying plant matter, like trees, plants, and they have a lot of railroad ties where the crickets live. So he got rid of the cricket, the railroad ties, and the scorpions left. You're just, you're just 